Wow. Oh, yeah, Grace. This is Grace. Oh, you're that side, aren't you? Oh, I'm this side, yeah, I'm this twin. How's it going? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, Grace! Yes. I hope you had a nice lunch. Uh, yes, welcome uh, to the creative stage. It's been a fantastic morning, really has. Uh, we're going to talk to you briefly for 10 minutes. We were meant to talk about something different, but we didn't really get time to prepare it, so we're going to do the same speech as earlier. Uh, we're going to talk to you. We think about the ultimate design is how to design your life for happiness. Um, where do we go with that? Okay, so... Backstory. Yes, okay, great. Okay, yeah, we want to give you our five tips on how to design your life for happiness. But before that, we're going to start with a little bit of backstory. So we're identical twins. Miguel, can we get the pictures up? If they can, okay, well, anyway, oh, okay. We oh, there we are, cool. Okay, yeah, you click the next one. I'm trying to. Okay, oh, there yes. we are, yes. Okay, so we're identical twins, we're twin boys. Uh, this one's called Stephen and this one's called David. Uh, so we're from a small town in Ireland called Greystones, just south of Dublin. We went to an old boys school and happiness for us was getting drunk and chasing women. And if you got a good woman, you were up high in the social status and that was happiness. We went and we studied business in college finished business and we were kind of very much sold the American dream. So I was really into making a million euros before I'm 30 and then I'll be happy. Here you go. Um, at the time, I guess we were doing... It's the American dream of money makes you happy. We were totally focused on it. And I guess being identical twins, we were always like, which one are you? Are you Dave? Are you Steve? Hey, Flynn Twin, which one are you? You know, we never had our own identity. So when we reached 21, we had finished college, and Mom said, lads, come on. It's about time you grew up and became your own person. So uh, we had a divorce, not a formal divorce, but uh, we went traveling the world separately on a typical journey of self-discovery. So we went off trying to find meaning in our life. We went trying to explore our social condition and doing anything weird and wonderful. You know, meditation centers, hippie, gather, gather, hippie gatherings, polyamorous communities, anything weird and wacky. Uh, and anyway, we, we left meatheads that were kind of models and we were very much into the American dream. We came back long-haired hippies with a strong body odor and a dream of creating a happier, healthy world. The big thing, though, is that we had gone away from, like, we'd left being burger-eating, pint-drinking, pizza-eating, and we came back as a pair of vegetarians. Oh, oh my God. Which was, you know, it was crazy in Ireland anyway. So I guess so much had changed within us, our own priorities, that health and happiness was, and community was what we were all about. So we came back and Steve had the idea, let's start a, a vegetable shop. So here we were, two 24-year-old males that had left us kind of, we were busy, you know, we, we had loads of potential. And okay, you're going off wandering there. Shh. Okay, okay, okay. 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 Right. In 2004, we started a business, we called it the happy pair, because we're twin brothers, we're a pair. We were happy and we started with a veg shop. So it was two hippies in a red van and a dream of creating a happier, healthier world. Sounds like a great Walt Disney movie, doesn't it? Um, but roll on 13 years. Uh, there's now 165 people with us. We'll do 10 million this year. Uh, we, will, we wrote two be number one best-selling cookbooks. We have three cafes, a farm shop. We do lots of funny stuff anyway, uh, and it's really cool. But we're going to get back to the reason why we're here. Our five top tips to design, optimize your life for happiness. I guess, I guess I'm going to start that with a question, though. In this room here... Who kind of prioritizes financial wealth over happiness? Hands up. Yes, there's a few money, money. A few honest people. Okay, and who prioritizes happiness over money? Liars. Okay. Liars. <laughs> um, but I guess we were talking last night and we were saying, okay, we've got five kids together. Uh, not together. Five kids. Between us. Five kids between us. And I guess as fathers, the thing which we want most for our kids is happiness. You know, everyone wants to feel good and be happy. So we were thinking the most ultimate design, it's not about a product, it's not about something that spits out money, it's about designing your life that optimizes happiness. So we were thinking, our, here's our five top tips, we have five minutes, we're going to talk to you our five top tips for designing a life for happiness. First one, totally cliched, you'll all have heard it before, do what you love. Many people go out with the goal of making money, money is a byproduct of doing great work. You're much more likely to do great work if you love what you do. Beautiful. Thank you, Dave. Uh, can I tell one quick story about yeah, that? Go, yeah, go. Okay. I remember uh, when we started our business, obviously, we started with a vegetable shop, which wasn't sexy in any sense. It wasn't tech. It wasn't a startup. It was a vegetable shop in a small town in Ireland. And we had a little red van. We'd get up at 4.30 in the morning. And anyway, there was a college reunion with all the other, other lads who'd studied business. And they were all wearing suits, and they were stockbrokers, bankers. You know, they, were, they had proper jobs. And uh, I rocked in in the little red van, parked me little red van and went in. And uh, one of the lads turns to me and says, Flinner, is that true 
that you bought a vegetable shop and you sell cabbages and you drive a van. And I turned around and I said, living the dream. Because for us it had totally changed. It really was. Our priorities had shifted so much. And a lot of mom and dad's friends from the golf club and the bridge club, we'd gone to university, we were good at sports. It was like we had a lot of potential. And here we were like dropouts, driving a van, smelling a cabbage. And lots of mom and dad's friends thought we were, they're definitely selling drugs out the back, definitely. We weren't, but um, we anyway. weren't, just to put that in context. Okay, so point number one, do what you love, no matter how crazy Everyone it is. knows that, but it's, it's as applicable today as ever. Point number two, move. We're mammals. We forget we're sophisticated mammals that wear clothing and have phones and do things like work uh, to get money, to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, so move in whatever manner that makes you happy, uh, whether it be handstands or whatever. But hands up, who is a dog here? One person, two, oh, no, great, three. Up dogs here. Okay, what happens when you don't walk your dog? Yeah, it, the first okay. day it starts climbing up the walls. It's like, it's wired. Day two, it starts looking a little sad. Day three, it's outright depressed. Oh. Now, the thing is, we are mammals too. We need to move. And on that note, can everyone just stand up for a sec? Okay, so what's our primary fuel source as mammals? Most people think it's coffee, it's cake, it's, it's chocolate, sex. it's sex. It's not. Everyone, jump up and down. Jump, jump up, up and down. Jump up and down. Go on, everyone, oh, jump I'm up and down. Come on. Okay, you can sit down. Sit down now. Perfect. Does everyone feel more awake? What's the primary fuel source? Jumping, Jumping up, up and, and down. down. No. no. Uh, it's oxygen. Uh, if you think about it, the longest period of time someone's lived without food is 368 days. Longest period of time without water, you get about a week. How long without oxygen? Five minutes. So oxygen is our primary fuel source. So movement, so important. Beautiful. That was point number two. Beautiful. Point number three. Point number three, support, community. Beautiful. Okay, so point number three. So we're talking about designing, optimizing your life for happiness, the ultimate design. Point number three, community. Obviously, we all want to belong. We all want to feel part of something. We're social creatures. We all have bad days, no matter how much we pretend not to. We all have crap days, and that's when we need to have friends and community to support us and keep us up. Can I tell a quick little story on that? Quick story, Okay, yes. quick story. Uh, so we started our business, and it was cafes, and it was shops. And when we first started, we had a vegetable shop, and it was in Ireland, and in winter it's cold, so the wind had come in, and it'd be cold. So we'd cook porridge every morning for breakfast, and we'd eat it. And Sally was the manager at the time, she said, lads, like, I got a great idea. Why don't we sell the porridge too? And we said, Sally, you're a genius. I love that thinking. And Steve said, no, we live in Greystones. We open at nine o'clock. Everyone's had their brekkie. You're mad. No one's going to buy it. And anyway, they had a little row, and Steve said, right, I got an idea. Let's give the way... Let's give away the porridge for free. And if people won't take it for free, they're definitely not going to pay for it. So uh, we gave the porridge away for free for a week. And people, they really enjoyed it. They felt good. You know, we felt good about it. And it came to the end of the week. And Sally was like, right, Steve, what are we charging for porridge? Five euro, 10 euro, two euro. And uh, Steve says, oh, geez, I don't know. I feel really good about it. I feel happy. Other people feel happy. Let's give it away for free for another week. So we gave it away for free for another week. And that week has been about 10 years. And we've given away, I'd say, a million bowls of porridge by now. But uh, just a simple little thing that compounds happiness and doesn't cost much and is really good for business, surprisingly, as well. Okay, Beautiful. great. Woo! Woo! Go porridge! <laughs> uh, thank you. Thanks a million. Uh, point number four, health. Health sounds so boring and so dull. Uh, it really does. Okay, can I say what? Oh, you go on. No, you go. Okay, oh, I'll go for it. Okay, okay you go. Uh, Duke University, one of the Ivy League colleges in the States, they did a study trying to find out what was the most important factor for health, or for happiness, for, health, for happiness. And you think in modern day society, it was having a fast car, having a million dollars or a billion dollars or whatever you're Getting into. Getting loads of sex. Getting loads of sex or drugs or whatever it is. However, what you reckon it was? Oh, it was health. health. So boring. But they find the most central thing to happiness as humans is health. And I guess it kind of works inversely because it's when you're ill health, it's very difficult to be happy. Beautiful. That was very good. Thanks. Uh, happy heart one, we'll skip. We only have a minute left. Okay, fundamentally, I think, uh, so just to recap, first thing, do what you love. Second thing, move. Third thing, get support, community, whatever form that is. Fourth thing was oh, health. Our products. Oh, we wrote books. Oh, yeah, we wrote books. Yeah. Okay, there's the books. Oh, anyway. And we do social media stuff. Okay. Uh, and the last and final one is love. This, this is the most important thing. So as the Beatles song says, all you need is love. Just as applicable as any. So wait, 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 wait. When, we grew up in Catholic Ireland, and Mom used to make us go to Mass every day. And we go to Mass, the bit we enjoyed most was the... How are you doing? Peace, peace be, be with, with you. you. Peace be with you. That was you. the bit we used to love most. So I think human touch is so important. So on that note, can everyone stand up again, please?
We're not going to make you jump up and down this time. And we're not going to rob your handbag. Everyone stand up. Come on, no Everyone. one's going to rob gonna your laptop. You're going to if you don't stand up. Okay, so ultimately turn. all we need is love. So turn around to the person beside you and give them a hug. Go on, you've got our permission. Give them a hug. Beautiful. Okay, let's have a lovely afternoon. Woo! Anyway. We're the happy pair. Welcome to the creative stage. It's going to be an incredible afternoon. First up, we've got Mark from Fjord. He's Fjord an incredible the, designer. It's one of the biggest design companies in the world. Mark's a super cool dude. And Mark wants to try to change the conversation. That's his big thing. He's going to talk about how tech is changing the conversation. So can we give us a massive round of applause for Mark from Fjord? Thank you very much. Um, how do you follow that with energy? I will try my best. So I'm going to talk about conversations. Um, getting the... So Fjord is, uh, we're about 1,000 people now. Uh, we're part of Accenture Interactive. Uh, we're in 28 studios around the world. And I want to talk a little bit today about the role that uh, technology is playing in the way in which humans do conversations. So a long time ago, uh, Plato wrote, about um, two Egyptian characters, Thoth, uh, who was a god, and Thamis, who was a king. And Thoth was the god of gifts, a bit like Hermes in Greek mythology or Roman mythology. And Thoth comes fluttering down to earth one day and says to Thamis, King Thamis, I have a new gift to give your people. He actually calls it a techne. It was a technology. And the king says, well, what is a technology? And Thoth says, it is called writing. And then goes on to explain the benefits of writing and what it will confer on his people. And to the gods' enormous surprise, the king said, well, can you go away for a week? I need to think about it. Come back. I'm not sure I want the gift. I need to ruminate. So he went away and he came back a week later. And the king said, thank you very much for the offer of your gift, this new techne, writing. I've decided to decline it on behalf of my people. And the god was astonished, as gods are, when somebody refuses their gifts, and said, why? And he said, I am worried that this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls. What Plato was trying to tell us was that with every step forward we make with technology, there is a step back too. And it's behoven on us to, I think, right now, to think very hard about this in the context of what is happening with technology right around the world, and particularly when it comes to conversations. So why are conversations important? They're important because we discover ourselves through conversations. Even this morning, chatting with somebody about what I was going to say, I realized something I'd not put together before about conversations, and I realized it because I was talking to somebody. But it's also about the learning about ourselves. It's the way in which we discover ourselves. And that's why conversations have been important throughout human history. In fact, there have been several moments in human history when conversations have really been front and center of, di of the dialogue of history. So it happened in Greece with symposia, which were where um, men, I'm afraid it was entirely men at that stage, got together and talked earnestly about political and philosophical issues. It happened again in London in the 16 and 1700s with the invention of coffee houses, which became all the rage. And coffee houses were the places where people had what in today's terms, you would describe as genuinely, again, I'm afraid it was only men at that stage, democratic conversations. So, switch to a century later, and in France, and at this stage, women enter, uh, women of power, aristocrats, who curated salons where conversations took place. And those salons were key to the development of the Enlightenment. So, again and again and again, we have conversations, formalized social conversations, as constructs which actually push uh, civilization, democracy, philosophy forward. Now, all of those took place without really any technology enhancing them, except coffee and, and alcohol. So if you think of coffee and alcohol as technologies, they enhanced the conversations a bit, but they weren't actually what we think of as technology now. So with technology now, actually quite a lot has happened. And what I want to talk about is what gets added and what gets lost when we've added technology into the conversation. So, oh, we seem to have some, yes. So on the left-hand side here, you have uh, a medieval script. And on the right-hand side, you have a telegram. So both of these things are technologies, both introduced permanence into the conversation, 
This telegram, actually, I found earlier this year when my mother passed away, and it was a telegram from the uh, War Ministry in London in 1944, telling her that her fiancé had died. So, quite a major piece of communication, but asynchronous, very different from the sort of conversations we were having before. And then, of course, um, the telephone is invented, a little bit after the telegram and a little bit after books, and what the telephone does is it reintroduces synchronicity into conversations. Now, you can talk with people and have synchronous conversations mediated by a technology, but what it also does is it takes distance away. So you can have those conversations with people a very long way away. Run forward over 100 years, and this thing begins to appear in our homes. Um, and I, I don't know how many of you are around. Have we got the sound? In the, late 90, in, the, in the mid 1990s. But those of you who were will remember this horrible sound which accompanied everything we had to do on the internet in those days. It feels like I'm talking about something that happened in Noah's day. But what this did, and we talked about it a lot at the time, was it introduced interactivity to our, to our conversations with companies or with things. And that was startlingly new. You could never talk back to a medium before. And suddenly, with Interactive, with the aid of this noisy little box, you could talk back to a medium. I think with the benefit of hindsight, what we can also see now is this marked the death of privacy. So a step forward, we can be interactive with companies, with things, with ideas. A step back, privacy, even if it hasn't died completely, certainly becomes a lot harder. Now, with each of these new technologies all the way down the line, what's particularly noticeable is you get new etiquettes emerging. So, email, for example, is an asynchronous communication, but it's based on letters, otherwise it wouldn't be called email, and there is a known start and end to an email. Many of us still say hello at the beginning of an email and sign it off with regards or kind regards or whatever it may be. So, they have a, a known beginning and end. But with instant messaging, which came along with the internet, you actually have a very unclear beginning and ending, even though it goes back to synchronicity. But for the first time ever with instant messaging, you can pause the synchronicity. Now, that hasn't happened. That doesn't happen with telegrams, doesn't happen with letters, doesn't happen with real life conversations that we have, and it, and it certainly doesn't happen with, uh, with the telephone. So, with each of these new media, you get the etiquette changing. And I want you to think a bit, I want you to remember this word etiquette, because it's actually very important. The etiquette of how we talk on things actually changes all the time. And that change is happening faster and faster, because of course, more or less 10 years ago, we had the introduction of smartphones. And what smartphones brought with them was spontaneity. You can have that conversation no matter when and where, whether you're on the toilet, whether you're walking through a park, when you're on holiday, a long way away. But what we also see very clearly, or at least we're becoming very conscious of now, is the essential distractive nature of having a smartphone through which you can have conversations at any time of the day. And, we've all, and we still haven't figured out the etiquette of when it's good to look at your phone and when it's good to pay attention to the people in front of you. And I think we've definitely overbalanced towards uh, preferencing the charm of the distant as against to actually focusing on the charm of what's in front of our eyes. Because somehow, deep down, we believe, I think, instinctively, that there's something more interesting or possibly better for us a distance away, and our phones are the gateways to open that up. So the phone introduces distraction, but it also gives us spontaneity. They're two sides of the same conversational coin. And we also get lots of new media with the phone. And again, with those new media, Again, we have to navigate all the different etiquette that comes with those new media. So I think at this stage, we've seen the challenge that technology presents up until now with conversations. It's time to step back and say, well, actually, what does it mean to be human in the digital age? And Nicholas Negroponte, um, around about the time I started my career in digital, in about 94, 95, wrote a book called Being Digital. I think what's interesting now for many of us is what does it mean to be human in the digital age, not what does it mean to be digital. And if you think about the way in which we express ourselves, we express ourselves in a whole number of different ways. But if you look at what's happened with the internet, initially at least with technology, most of these got wiped off the map. So the command line interface has no body language in it. It's an almost completely inhuman 
form of expression. There's almost no, I mean, maybe a coder could detect humanity in this, but most of us ordinary mortals can't. But what has happened with digital over the last 20 years, and, and it's hard to prove whether this has been deliberate or because we've asked for it, is that we've reintroduced body language. And we've, we've been reintroducing body language in a whole number of different ways as we've gone forward. And body language is very important to us. A humorous amount of our communication is bound up in body language. Trump, whether you hate him or love him, is a master at body language. It's, it's not difficult to tell what he's thinking, even if his mouth is saying something different. So, the first place we saw body language coming back in was emojis. I suggest to you that emoticons and emojis are just a primitive way of trying to put our body language, smiles, winks, shrugs, etc., back into our communication, which had been stripped out by the use initially of the keyboard and the command line interface. But actually, what we started doing, almost in a guerrilla movement, is putting them back in. And of course, the social media companies have embraced that and made them a formal part of it. The next way we started to put body language in was through pictures, especially selfies. I, I think this is just body language. This is a way of sending body language from phone to phone. And then that what came along, inevitably, was a rise of video. So this is a video I was sent just a couple of months ago when I was somewhere overseas, and my family went to see my son. He's 10, playing drums at a school concert. And what I discovered, I don't know whether you can hear it, he's playing um, Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, uh, which really blew me away. I didn't know he knew how to play it, and I didn't know he was going to do this. But the really big thing about this is the body language of the two parents in front who visibly lift when they recognize the tune. And then I started looking at Billy, my son, and I realized, oh my god, I've never seen him concentrate like this before. So thanks to video sent to me 5,000 miles away, I could see that my son, who's 10 and doesn't normally concentrate a lot, actually had something he could really concentrate on. So body language communicated itself through this video. And then the next thing we get is we get the rise of conversations as interfaces and even markets. Now, we've seen less of this in the West. Famously, China is all over this. What the Chinese recognized through WeChat and other services was that uh, conversations are a place where you can actually buy and sell things. And actually, that accords with human history. Marketplaces were places we went to not just to buy things or sell things, but to communicate, to get news, to find out what was going on, etc. And that's all that's happened, is we've put markets back into conversations, and, and that's you know, been one of the big new trends of the last two or three years. Now, there's another thing happening here which is very interesting, which is that phone calls are in decline. And I talked about the etiquette earlier on. My 16-year-old daughter doesn't do phone calls. I don't mean that she doesn't ever take phone calls. I mean that she doesn't actually understand the etiquette of phone calls. And if you look around and watch teenagers doing phone calls these days, they don't know how to do them. She does not know how to start and end a phone call in a way which I understand. So I'll phone her and typically I'll get a, hello? Who's that? Uh, yeah, no, as I was saying to you, uh, about five o'clock, we'll be get, daddy? Uh, and then anyway, I was going to, so she doesn't know how to do it. She doesn't know how to begin or end a phone conversation in a way that I'm familiar with, which is cool because she has a whole number of other ways of communicating and sending messages. But phone calls are definitely in decline. The stats show it. All the telcos are worried about it. But the fact that those, tel that those tel telephone calls are in decline doesn't mean that voice is going away. Because as we all now know, largely thanks to Amazon and Alexa, voice is on the rise. And what we're going to see next, in fact, um, Amazon have introduced this just recently, is you no longer need to have a telephone uh, in order to, well, you can phone an Echo device. I don't know how many of you have experimented with it. You can phone an Echo device from your phone through the Alexa app. I did it about a week ago, and I literally made my wife and one of my daughters jump out of bed uh, because we have an, an Echo in the bedroom, and I suddenly spoke to them when they weren't expecting it. Whole load of new etiquette needed there, and I don't even begin to know what it is yet, but we're going to have to figure it out. You can get Echoes to talk to each other in the house. So, the idea of phone as a place which you need in order to make a phone call, that's going away, and it's going away pretty quickly. What I also think we're going to get is proactive communication from those devices. You may not like the sound of it, but I'm rock solid sure that the next thing that we will see, because companies will begin to push at this, and actually Amazon have opened up the APIs to do it with Alexa, is that 
Alexa will speak to you when you haven't asked her to. Now, there are issues around that. There's definitely etiquette around it, but it's definitely going to happen. And then there are bots and artificial intelligence. Um, and these are changing the nature of conversations as well. But we don't actually have to have bots which are human to be human-centered. And they have a number of affordances of their own, particularly robots, chatbots, artificial intelligence, is literally tireless. And, and, and as a point, I just want to dwell on that briefly. I don't know how many of you have seen um, a robot lawnmower in action, but it's really fascinating when you see one if you're interested in cutting grass, which sadly I am. But, but a robot lawnmower doesn't get tired. So it cuts the lawn. They're very, very small. And I was looking at one, I'm wondering, how the hell do they get it that small? And I suddenly realized it can be that small because it's infinitely patient. It can cut the grass for 12 hours a day. And no human being has the patience to do that, which means they're able to scale it down. So patience with bots is actually a thing that they can do, which humans aren't very good at doing. But what we're going to get next in our conversations is artificial intelligence powering chatbots to have brand conversations. And we're seeing this begin to happen at the moment. Now, I think there are some very, very big implications around this and very big implications for conversations. In particular, artificial intelligence is beginning to get very good at understanding who we are. It can do that by watching the pattern with which we type. There is software which can detect if you're depressed by doing that. It can do it through computer vision by looking at us Many of you will have seen the very controversial research done at Stanford University, which was announced quite recently, where two um, students have used artificial intelligence and downloaded hundreds of thousands of photographs from, uh, from an open dating website with their metadata and have taught the artificial intelligence to much more accurately than the human guess whether a human is gay or not gay. Now, there are lots of implications behind that which we don't have time to go into. But what's interesting about it is that better than a human can do, already we have artificial intelligence beginning to know things about ourselves just by looking at a photograph. Now, what we think will happen next is that computers will begin to try to mirror us. So mirroring is an ancient thing that we do with body language. We cross our arms when other people cross our arms. We cross our legs. We put our heads on one side. We mirror in conversations. We pick up terminology other people are doing. We adapt to their cadence. We may not know we're doing it, but we do it all the time. It's very subtle, and it's one of the reasons that we managed to evolve to where we are now, because we used it to become sociable creatures. I suggest that using artificial intelligence, no company on Earth will be able to resist the charm of mirroring its customers by knowing who they are, by understanding who they are, by scraping their social media. That can be done, by the way. Go and look at a site called crystalnose.com, which scrapes all your social media and does a very accurate Myers-Briggs-like uh, personality profile on you. So if they can do that, then what happens when you talk to a company soon is they'll be scraping your social media, they'll be looking at you, they'll be thinking about the way they interact, and they will drive their chatbot through machine learning to mirror who you are. Now, what's the consequence of that? Just put on one side the ethics of it. What's the consequence of that from a brand's or a design perspective? It means every brand becomes like you. Now, that's interesting from our perspective, but now think of it from the brand's perspective. That means that at any given moment, a popular brand may be live managing one million different or more different manifestations of what the brand is. That's a living brand. That's a complete transformation from everything we've known about brands so far. If brands become more like us as individuals, that completely changes the way in which we go to market. So where is all of this going when we put it together? So I think the powerful combination here is artificial intelligence, the rise of voice, and the digitization of absolutely everything around us, cars, homes, workplaces, um, all of that means that we're heading, as far as conversations are concerned, towards what I call a conversational singularity. A conversational singularity is a place where the devices actually begin to disappear. We don't think about the devices so much anymore. They're going to begin to merge into the background. They may, in fact, be part of the background. And at that stage, if this is right, we will begin to imagine and do 
the idea that we can have conversations everywhere and with everything at any given moment. If that is correct, it's completely transformative for humans and for our relationship with machines and for our relationships with other people. Three different things, self-knowledge, knowledge of others, what machines know about us. And of course, if you really want to push this out in the not too far distant future, there's enough going on with technology now to be able to read our thoughts. We've done some work on this at Fjord to be able to give machines the power to understand what we're thinking. And that's going to shift conversations forever. But probably that's just a little bit too far out right now. So what are the implications? We're going to need new etiquettes. I think that's for certain, because we've already seen the way in which etiquettes change rapidly over time when we have to introduce one, uh, new ones. The second, the second thing is machines are going to know some of us. Think back to what Socrates said. The unexamined life is not worth living. Our lives will be examined, but they're going to be examined by machines. Again, I'm not making a comment on whether that's wise or not, ethical or not, but it's going to happen, and we need to get used to the fact that that potential is there now because it changes the notion of an unexamined life. So what are the questions we need to ask? We need to ask, how can we use technology to enhance brand conversations? Because it's coming now very, very rapidly. How can we get back, if there ever was such a thing, and as a historian, I'm skeptical of the idea of golden ages, but if we can imagine a golden age, how can we move into a new golden age of conversations? Because I think if we use the technology correctly, we could go there. And last but not least, if machines can read all of these conversations, they can keep them too. If they can keep them, that means that all conversations, if the conversational singularity theory is correct, will remain forever. I'll leave you with one thought. There's a lot of conversations about whether or not machines can replace humans. So, machines can do empathy. I don't think they can mean empathy. I think only humans can mean empathy and love with each other. And that's the thing we need to hang on to. So thank you very much, and remember to love.